Thank you for joining us, and welcome to the Situating Science Podcast. I'm Izzy Marin, cluster student at the Situating Science Strategic Knowledge Cluster. This is the next installment in a series of podcasts complementing the ongoing Lives of Evidence National Lecture Series. The lecture series will be looking at the lives and death of evidence. Because the death of evidence is on everyone's lips, key questions are being raised in various realms of research. Some of the questions raised by the speakers will explore how evidence is produced, how trust in evidence and research can be maintained or destroyed, the relationship between research, funding, and policy, and whether or not transparency has a place in research. The lecture series will highlight the urgency of these matters and what we can do to prolong and enhance the lives of evidence. Today we are talking with Dr. James Robert Brown, Professor of Philosophy at the University of Toronto. Dr. Brown's research interests include the philosophy of science, the philosophy of mathematics, the foundation of physics, and the social relations of science. Dr. Brown's talk, titled Patents, Progress, and Commercialized Medicine, explores the realm of commercialized medicine and the associated risks to public health. Specifically, Dr. Brown observes the preferential treatment that patentable solutions receive, as well as financial conflicts of interest in corporate research funding. So, Dr. Brown, an article you wrote in 2000 titled Privatizing the University, the New Tragedy of the Commons, you discuss the privatization of the institution and the growing sense of the university as increasingly abiding by a business model. Is there a correlation of this same motion in medical research? And in what ways do the two realms, that is the medical and the educational, play into one another? Very generally, over the past 30 years or so, the Reagan-Thatcher era and ever since, there's been, um, the, the public sphere has been getting smaller and smaller. Um, government support for research and so on is getting smaller and smaller. And this is part of a general package. And now governments everywhere, almost everywhere in the world, I'd say, is um, forcing universities to join into what are called public-private partnerships. And what that often means is that there will be taxpayer support for research. However, private, there'll be a private uh, aspect to this. They'll sink in some money, and they are very often the tail that wags the dog. And so the direction of research can often be governed by them, not by um, open-minded researchers who are trying to figure out the best solution to a health problem. When you've got private corporations calling the tune, as they often do, they'll look for solutions to health problems that are patentable. They can make a profit from that. Solutions to health problems that involve, say, diet or exercise, which might, in fact, be quite, quite a bit better than, say, drug solutions, um, they won't get a look in for the simple reason that you can't patent broccoli and or bicycle riding and say, you know, you're going to feel a lot less depressed if you go for a bike ride every day. Once that hits the internet, nobody can make a penny off it. It's just public knowledge. Mm -hmm. How do you think that plays into policy making and public health? Well, what it means is that um, more and more policy is driven by cooperation with business um, a government like the Harper government in Canada and most uh, uh, administrations in the U.S., both Democrat and Republican, what they want yeah, out of university research are products that will be commercially viable. They want to make money. They want their economy to grow on the back of research. And often this is a, you know, perfectly laudable. It's good. We want a, a more prosperous country, not less. But we we are often sacrificing high-quality medicine for inferior medicine that simply will make more money for, for some corporations. What does this mean for the well-meaning researcher? It means if you want research funding, it's harder and harder to get it from a neutral source, like a government source, which says, we're very happy to have you investigate X, but we don't tell you what you have to find. But when you get private funding, they say, we want you to investigate X, and here's what you have to find. I don't mean they're dictating the precise solution, but what they mean is we want you to investigate, let us say, depression, but we want you to come up with a chemical solution to this that is patentable. We don't want to put a penny into your hunch that going for a bike ride every day might lift people's mood. That's worthless to us. Who is actually benefiting from the corporatization of medical research? Corporations. Now, people will tell you, and certainly corporations will tell you, the public's benefiting because we're, they say we're getting better drugs and having marvelous breakthroughs because 
the, uh, the, the, the incentive, the commercial incentive of the free market guarantees us top quality products, new innovations all the time. When you actually look close at the record, it's not working out to be like this at all. The U.S. Food and Drug Administration is mandated to license any drug that has gone through a uh, randomized clinical trial and beaten a placebo. And it must not have any terrible uh, uh, har um, side effects, too. But if it can beat a placebo, it, it will be licensed. And then, then um, advertising and marketing take over. And we get inferior products that are well advertised because maybe an older generic product, which is actually quite superior, and not only beats a placebo by a hair, but by a long shot, nobody's going to make any profits out of those because there are no royalties associated with those anymore. And so the, um, the public is actually getting second-rate drugs, which are more expensive, often worse side effects, and um, the corporations are making a great deal of money. We, the taxpayer, are paying you know, for our health care system and getting inferior products. We, as consumers of those products when we're sick, are getting second-rate products and so on. It is not a happy situation. So why are we not getting good products? One of the reasons we're not getting good products is because of the extraordinary complexity of pharmaceutical research. When you go to the store and you buy a new um, iPod, you simply plug it in and you can hear it. You know it works. But when you're taking something like a statin or blood pressure medicine or Prozac or something like that, you're not really sure it's having an effect on you. The evidence that it is is statistical, and it's built over thousands of people, and often the effect is very slight. So where let's take something like depression. If people are mid-level depression, and um, about a quarter of them would probably feel better after a while, spontaneously. They don't need any medication. If they take Prozac, about a third of them will feel better. Now that looks like Prozac is doing something. Um, not much, mind you, because we're still only going up from, let's say, a quarter to a third, something like that. But it's so hard to tell in individual cases whether it's good or bad. People often, because they're feeling better, say they swear by the drug. They'll recommend it to others. They say, this is terrific. But the fact is we don't have evidence in individual cases. We only have it in statistical cases. Now let me add one more thing about Prozac. The whole class of drugs of which Prozac is one and Zoloft is another. A few years ago, uh, a lot of um, clinical trials that were never published were uncovered. And it turns out that Prozac does not beat a placebo. It ties with a placebo. So when people are feeling better thanks to Prozac, as likely as not, it's really a placebo effect they're feeling. It's a very powerful placebo effect. And so a lot of people are certainly feeling better. But it's very hard to tell what's actually going on from a causal point of view. And that's why drug research is really very, very unlike, you know, buying a new uh, iPod. Do you think there's any way, given the complexity of medical research and corporatization, to overcome these challenges? There is, but it's drastic. I think the, um, my recommendation, um, which in one way is very simple and straightforward, is nevertheless, from a sort of political point of view, the most drastic. What I would like to do is socialize medical research and get rid of uh, patents, uh, intellectual property rights, royalties, and the whole shebang when it comes to medical research, especially pharmaceutical research. I'm not calling for the end of patents everywhere. Mm -hmm. I'm perfectly happy to have Apple have a patent and make a lot of money on iPods. Mm -hmm. But I don't trust what's going on in medical research when, when corporate profits are so huge when it comes to drug research. Mm -hmm. There are a, a, a popular drug like Prozac makes billions of dollars a year. And so the incentive to cheat in the clinical trials, which provide the evidence for this, the incentive to cheat is extraordinary. Is there any way that uh, the average consumer can protect themselves or um, become better educated? Because because of the complexity that we've been talking about, it, it seems fairly inaccessible. In principle, yeah, but practically, no. We're, you would have to immerse yourself to such an extent and get hold of clinical trials and, and become a statistician yourself in order to be making um, reasonable judgments. Um, what I can tell you is 
I have friends who are by no means flakes. They're not anti-modern medicine. They're not into alternative medicines or anything like that. But they work in this area, and they, have, they, have, they often follow a general rule of thumb. They'll take no drug produced since 1980. Yeah, that's a powerful indictment of what's going on right now. But I, I don't think, uh, I mean, most of us uh, are in the hands of our physicians. We go to our doctor, we say, you know, we say this hurts and that hurts, and, you know, and our doctor says, well, you probably got such and such and so and so, and I think you should take this medication. And there's really not very much we can do. We can look up Internet discussions, but Internet discussions are often all over the place. And you have no idea, as an ordinary person, how to evaluate these, which ones are on track and which ones are just goofy nonsense. No, I think we need, we need um, uh, appropriate government agencies to look out af uh, for us, mm -hmm. and none of this caveat emptor business. It kind of sounds like a good step for citizens to take would be to rally for, for a mediator coming from the government. The best way for the public to, de uh, to uh, defend itself is maybe two-pronged. There's a, this general problem about the Harper government squashing its own scientists. Um, that has to be uh, uh, tackled, and the public can certainly get behind that and, and force the, the Harper government to back down. Um, the other thing they can do is say, there seems to be enough evidence out there by people who seem to know what they're talking about, that there's a real problem with uh, medical research. And therefore, dear Mr. Harper, maybe it would be better if all research funds in Canada, where you have control, um, were not tied to public-private partnerships. Stop forcing these upon our researchers. There's wonderful people in Canada in the various science departments who are perfectly capable of doing spectacularly good work. And they do it because they like it. They're, they're do-gooders <laughs> and, they're, and they're, they're curious and maybe even they want a little fame and fortune, but they're not expecting to become multimillionaires. Mm -hmm. They have good salaries and that's incentive enough for them. And of course, we have spectacular people in physics and in mathematics, and there's no, nobody in those fields makes money. I mean, no mathematician makes money from, you can't patent stuff in math any more than you can in philosophy. So for the love of science, let's rally. Thank you for chatting with us today, Jim, and thank you to the listeners for tuning in. For more information on the National Lecture Series and for more podcasts, visit situsci.ca. That's S-I-T-U-S-C-I dot C-A.